Welcome to Saving Europe. I'm the novelist and historian Henry Viner Brooks, and in this series, we're following the lives and travels of two of history's unsung heroes. The decisive leadership shown by the 6th century monk Columbanus and the 20th century statesman Robert Schumann helped rescue Western civilization in two very different dark ages. So, joined by my two sons, I'm on a 4,000 mile, 12 country, post Brexit odyssey to find out if these men and these dark ages can teach us anything for today. In this episode, we descend the Julian Alps in search of a young man called Jonas, who would one day become Columbanus' biographer. In the Roman town of Susa, amidst the most astonishing antique ruins that we found anywhere on our travels, we catch a rare glimpse of the generation that form a bridge between the fading Roman world and the new medieval synthesis. This time on Saving Europe. If you're finding this content helpful, then please return the favour by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and perhaps even sharing it with a friend. And also do check out the new book which accompanies this series. Thanks for watching. This is Briancon. You can see various chateaus and um, fortresses. Obviously, whoever could hold Briancon could hold the pass, a major pass to Italy, I guess. More up here, more gun placements. At the time when I'm writing my um, Renaissance novels, the French held the, the technology to make uh, Italy tremble. It was the steel cannonballs, new technology, and the firepower cannon casting technique that really tipped the balance. And uh, Cardinal D'Amboise uh, came this way, I guess. It must have been this way down to Pavia. And he made all of Italy tremble, smashed their citadels. So, we've seen glaciers, and we've seen magnificent. Magnificent escarpments and uh, mountain peaks. The Parc des Ercrins is an amazing place. I must say, I'd like to come back. But today we cannot stop. We're in search of Jonas of Susa. But as we descend from the Alps towards Turin, we're going to pass through Susa. So it might be nice just to see if there's any memory of this uh, hagiographer. I'm just going to swat up over lunch about him, because I know he ended up as an abbot of a monastery up in France toward the end of his life. Yeah, yeah, so we just drove over the Italian border. The guards didn't seem particularly interested in us. We decided all the same not to film them. There's a sign here for Turin. 92 clicks. Souza, 42. Okay, well we can be there, I guess, for lunch, so that's good. Coming down from the hills into Susa, this is the town that Jonas knew. That was the Roman castrum up there. And that was, uh, we're outside the town walls at the moment. And there's the... I've been swatting up. Um, on my uh, my friend Alex O'Hara's book, because this is where Jonas grew up. Jonas is the biographer of Columbanus, so um, we've not found it yet. But there's some astounding Roman remains. There. Jonas of Susa grew up in this 
town. Until 574, this was still a Byzantine town. That is Roman, ruled from the Eastern Empire from Constantinople. Only after that did other forces move in. So he grew up in a land that had just been taken over by a foreign power. This was a very important Roman town. Originally, Susa was Celtic, and they held out against the Romans. But there was no way on the main road to, to Francia, to, to, to Gaul, that the Romans were not going to push out this way, and so they did. And today, Susa is famous for its Roman ruins, notably this, the Gate of Savoy, the Port of Savoy, but also the, uh, the Arch of Augustus on his way back from Gaul in 8 BC. Augustus built a fab fabulous arch, which I'm dying to see. So Jonas grew up amongst these um, magnificent Roman ruins. In, probably in his father's day, this was still under Byzantine control. It was only ceded to the Kingdom of Burgundy that way in uh, 574. I'm just trying to imagine what it must have been like to grow up with the greatness of Roman architecture. Just an interesting thought. What kind of education did Jonas have? And people aren't entirely sure, but the, I think the bulk of the opinion is that he probably didn't get it here, that he got it in, in Bobbio when he got there. So he joined the monastery at the age of 18. Yeah, that was three years after Columbanus had died. Gosh, look at this. That artful prince, Gibbon calls him, Augustus. He is the one who stole democracy from the Romans, but did it with such style that they still loved him and they called it their golden age. He was the uh, nephew of Julius Caesar, defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. He was the one who sacrificed uh, Cicero to Mark Antony's fury, or had him uh, had his hands and put above the speaker's roster in Rome. Being in a place like this really brings back, you know, all the stuff you've ever read about Rome. Coming here kind of gives you an idea that you were in a land of, they must have thought these things were built by giants. How far? how far people had fallen. I think it must have haunted them. Uh, this sort of latent cultural memory of greatness that they lost. Here's a castrum. When Columbanus is coming to, into Burgundy, these are the kind of places he's building on. And then to come and see carvings, look at this carving. They compare that, compare that with what Columbanus would have known in Ireland, the primitive carving of the Irish, to have seen that. An extraordinary reminder. Let's keep going. So yeah, he's an interesting, interesting guy, Jonas. He joins the monastery at 18. Uh, he travels extensively throughout Burgundy, Francia, his sources like Gallus, other, other eyewitness sources, Atala was his abbot, who was a close friend of Columbanus. So he had access to lots of material. And there is uh, certain rhetorical flourishes you can tell a, of a classical training. He's not the Latinist that Columbanus is, but he's got a good style. And of course the benefit is we're getting that biography within the, the, um, the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses. So yes, this weakness of hagiography, full of the same sorts of miracles, the glossing over of the big breakup with Gaul, it has its weakness, but it is a weakness born of love and humility. And uh, no genre is without its particular weakness. We are very grateful to Jonas. He finished his life many miles from where he grew up in Susa. Uh, he ended up at Parmoutier. If you remember Baganda Farah, she had Parmoutier, the, the, the dual monastery. He was certainly there celebrating a mass for one of the nuns that had died. 
Um, and later on, he went even further east into uh, Francia, where he founded his own monastery, according to a guy called uh, Jean Mabillon. In the um, 17th century, he identifies uh, Jonas as Jonatus, who established a monastery at Marciennes, a monastery close to Elnon. This community member was eventually led, oh, and, and nuns were led by Jonas. So, amazing, you know, guy from a small town, teenager, joins a monastery, travels the world, gets an education, and his writings are still preserved today. Inside the ruins of the old Roman castrum, we visited a museum which, again, really did give us an invaluable window into the peoples of the post-Roman world. A century and a half after Britain had descended into near anarchy, places like Susa were still clinging to the flotsam of high Roman culture by way of the fragmenting power of Constantinople. So it's very interesting. Um map here. This shows what's now called the Savoy Gate. In Jonas' day, it was just the Civitas Gate, the town gate. This is where the church of uh, uh, Justica is. And then we walk out through the garden up to the arch. And we're now in the museum here. And this is the kind of town that Jonas would have known. Um, right across uh, is the amphitheater, which we're going to see in a minute, God willing. Um, and he would have known that too. You know, Jonas is, is growing up. His dad was under Byzantine rule. His grandfather, that's what they knew, the Eastern Empire. But uh, of course, times were changing. So he grew up in this time, like, um, like Benedict had done, like Martin had done, a time of great change happening all the way through Europe. And yet, Jonas played his part in this great story, and he travelled far and wide. He wrote down the life of Bedast, the life of Columbanus. So, it's nice to be in his hometown. I've got a new respect having come here. This is the Roman amphitheatre of Jonas Town. Must have come here as a boy to play, it's strange. Still used today for performances. For those about to die, we salute you. I wonder what spectacles this place has seen when these gates opened. And in the words of one of the great Romans, are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? They must have looked on their Roman past with a mixture of awe and disgust. They must have despised so much of pagan Rome. And yet so much was to admire in this time of chaos where different power blocks, armies, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Theodoric over there in Ravenna, the armies of Byzantium trying to reclaim things, Belisarius trying to reclaim the empire of the West. So much carnage. Jonas grew up in that and he played his part. It was what we might think is a small part. He, he, like, he writes three vitas and then presides over a monastery and travels widely. It certainly squashes the idea of um, the Dark Ages. You know, there was so much still going on in the way of culture. And these monasteries were extraordinary cultural engines. I was thinking about it last night and I was thinking that they are not a work of nature, the monastery. They're a work of art. Um, when the armies, the Saxon armies came together, they would be shield wall to shield wall. If you wanted to pierce through, you, they would form the boar's tusk and they would make a wedge and they would drive through. The monasteries were like that, unnatural in their own way but a concentrated form of cultural engine, which was able to concentrate the, and free up the lives of young men, young women, to do extraordinary work. It just happened that it was exploding at the time when such engines were entirely necessary. OK, 
cannot be among these great Roman ruins without something stirring. It's almost like there's something in our cultural DNA. It was a contingent of history that Rome became what it became. At the time of Jonah's birth, it was just a really good thing that Rome was actually despised and forgotten about. The great Christian centers of, um, of uh, Constantinople, Alexandria of um, Antioch, they were the places that were the moving and shaking. They were the ones with the patronage of the Eastern emperors. Nobody foresaw that in the seventh century they would fall to the armies of Muhammad, uh, barring Constantinople. Columbanus' own relationship with the papacy is interesting. Some would have the Irish, very much their own people, and in many ways they were, and that mustn't be understated. But when Columbanus addresses the Pope, he is the fair ornament of the church. Columbanus, I think, had wanted to go to Rome. He is at once respectful. He pleads with the Pope for, oh, send me your commentary on, um, I think it was Ezekiel. Uh, instruct me, tell me where I'm wrong. And yet at the same time, he is firm. He is firm in his opinions. Uh, and you'd say, well, is it really humility? I think there is a humility. And they know that they're the Johnny come lately, and yet they have this extraordinary confidence, the Irish, as they crisscross um, the continent, and they, of course, became known as the Island of Scholars and Saints. And exactly how this happened will be the subject of the last episode in this season of Saving Europe. So next time, we will meet two of the all-time superstars of the early monastic age, who resourced Ireland from the outside. First is the Britanninian, who in 397 pioneered the first Christian startup north of Hadrian's Wall in Scotland. His Candida Casa, or White House, was where the tough-minded Ulster ex-warrior Ender got his training, before in turn becoming the mentor to other ambitious young founders like Brendan the Navigator and Columba of Iona. And then we'll also meet the Welshman who trained Finian of Clonard, who in turn trained the Twelve Apostles of Ireland, among whose number is Sinel, who trained a teenage Columbanus. The name Caddoc the Wise might sound like Gandalf the Grey from Lord of the Rings, and indeed there are some later mythic connections with King Arthur, but his training monastery at Lancarthur and his spiritual and academic legacy have been enormous. Speaking to Professor Madeline Gray from Cardiff University, we will track down the 6th century culture shaper's extraordinary journey from Wales to Brittany. All this and more next time on Saving Europe. Remember also that this journey was part of the research for a book which uses the lives of Columbanus and Schumann to explore the unlikely arrival, survival, victory and atrophy of European civilization. Do follow the links below to find out more. Please let us know what you thought of this episode, what you liked, what you didn't, what was new to you. Just start a conversation below in the comments section. And of course, if you found the content helpful, then we're pretty sure you're going to like this next one suggested here. But also while you're there, don't forget to help us by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.